So what I'd like to do is to kind of go on to the trim trial, which was sure. uh, which was amazing because it was the first time that the epigenetic clock was kind of wound back. Now, so I think our audience are probably uh, at a high level familiar with trim. Would you be able to provide a very short intro as to what um, what protocol you used and what the outcome was for for the for the original trim? Sure. So the objective of the trim trial was to take advantage of an observation that had been made many years before and was largely ignored. And that was the observation that it was possible to regrow the thymus gland. So to explain that, the thymus is the master gland of the immune system. It processes cells that are derived from the bone marrow into immune cells that are able to defend us against bacteria, viruses, and cancer, and other things as well. Those are called T cells since they're educated in the thymus. And you need those T cells to stay alive. Now, unfortunately, the thymus begins to peter out. Uh, it becomes more and more replaced by fat as we get older. And so the process of producing T cells uh, wanes and the T cells themselves are apparently very long lived. They can live many years and perhaps decades, but eventually uh, not producing them leads to a deficiency. They, they don't last forever and they start to die out. Uh, and so therefore between the ages of 60 and 80, you lose about 98% of your ability to recognize foreign invaders. And that's the age range in which everybody dies, just you know, by and large. That, that's, that's when uh, age-related mortality really takes off. And I don't think that's a, a coincidence. Uh, we also know that the thymus is linked into other aging processes, including aging processes that affect the brain, the liver, uh, insulin signaling, all kinds of things. So the, the immune system has great significance beyond just immunity itself. And the idea that you could actually regrow the thymus after it has withered and almost died and thereby restore immunity was a very appealing idea to me. And since uh, no one else seemed to be taking that up, we wanted to try to do this in normal aging people. There had been a couple of doctors who had uh, in desperation treating uh, HIV AIDS patients whose immune systems were being eaten by the AIDS virus the HIV virus, um, they tried using growth hormone to restore immune system function. They had a pretty good degree of success with that, but uh, that's a very small population and the thymus of those people is different from the thymus of you and me. So it wasn't really clear what would happen in older people. So we wanted to find out. So we, we uh, created a protocol uh, involving growth hormone, which is the same same substance that was able to regrow the thymus in, in the original observations of many, many years ago, and uh, two other agents because growth hormone has side effects. And I think one reason that growth hormone uh, has not you know, been a panacea against aging in, in the past is because it has these side effects, particularly it has some obvious side effects like joint uh, pain and things like that. But the the real uh, important one, in my view, is the silent one that people don't notice or pay much attention to, and that is the so-called diabetogenic effect of growth hormone, which is a tendency for growth hormone to raise insulin levels. So we wanted to we wanted to deliberately create a biological contradiction. We wanted to have the benefits of growth hormone, but but interfere with that second function of growth hormone of raising insulin levels. So we did that in two ways. One, by reproducing a natural biological contradiction that occurs in everybody as they're young, uh, which is mediated by the hormone DHEA or dehydroepiandrosterone. And the significance of this is that in youth, we have very large amounts of growth hormone, we have very large amounts of DHEA, and we have very normal levels of insulin. We are not diabetics when we're young. So there has to be a reason for that. What's different about an old person who takes growth hormone and gets diabetes essentially versus a young person who doesn't. And I hypothesize that the reason that there's a difference is that the young person has DHEA. So we tried that. I tried it on myself several times. We take growth hormone, mm -hmm. watch my, D, my insulin level go up. And then on the same uh, dose of growth hormone, uh, take DHEA on top of that and watch my insulin level come right back down to normal. So having satisfied myself that at least it worked on me, we decided to try it in this uh, initial clinical trial. And uh, 
in case that wasn't sufficient, we also added metformin because metformin is a wonderful drug uh, for increasing what is called insulin sensitivity, the ability of, of insulin to do whatever insulin wants to do. The beauty of that is that by, I mean, it's a little bit uh, paradoxical, but the beauty of that is by increasing the effectiveness of insulin, insulin concentrations in the bloodstream actually go down because you don't need as much insulin. So whatever insulin does is bad. You know, it, it may be uh, the, uh, the uh, areas of the body that uh, it's not very effective in uh, that, that uh, are the source of the problem. So if you increase uh, insulin effectiveness and you lower the concentration in the bloodstream, everything is much better. And one of the guidelines there is that calorie restriction has been known since 1935 to greatly extend lifespan of mammals. And the thing that's really striking to me about calorie restriction is that in that situation, both insulin and glucose are low at the same time, which means that one of the central features of calorie restriction for life extension is to enhance insulin sensitivity. In other words, insulin effectiveness so that insulin concentrations can go down. And so we were trying to mimic that as, as well as we could with trim. Right. And... So while we're on the, the protocol, you also included vitamin D and zinc, particularly yes. zinc. Uh, can you say why, why those? Yeah, uh, there's several reasons. Uh, the primary reason that we included zinc is that, I mean, there's several reasons, but the primary reason is that the thymus manufactures a uh, hormone uh, called thymulin uh, that requires zinc as a cofactor. And if you don't have enough zinc around, thymulin is no good and it doesn't do anything. And you need thymulin to sort of uh, take care of the health of the T cells that the thymus produces. So it would do us no good to regenerate the thymus and then have T cells that couldn't do anything because the thymus was not producing active uh, uh, thymulin. So we wanted to make sure that didn't happen. On top of that, uh, zinc has been shown to uh, be essential for all kinds of immune system functions all kinds of detailed immune system functions. There's even an amazing paper by Fabry in a book uh, that was published long ago. Uh, I'm sure everyone has forgotten by this time uh, that showed that you can actually use zinc to regrow the thymus of an old mouse. It's unbelievable. Unfortunately, it doesn't seem to work in people, but it uh, it's mm. certainly couldn't hurt. So we just wanted to make sure people were not deficient in zinc because we know that zinc is important for immune system function in general, and in particular, it's important for thymic hormone function. Right. So in the, the protocol you had, um, I, I think you had like 500 milligrams of metformin, 50 milligrams of DHEA, um, and, but then you tweaked it, right? It says, you, what you said was, uh, okay, we changed it. And, and like the growth hormone was 0.015 milligrams per kilogram. So can you talk a little bit about what did you, what did, what were you looking for when you changed it and, and how did you change it? Did you change all of them or only the growth hormone? Well, we changed everything. Well, we didn't oh. change the zinc or the, or the vitamin D. We kept that right. as constant. Uh, but the other three agents we did, we did uh, tweak as necessary. So we tweaked the growth hormone uh, to try to optimize uh, IGF-1 levels. So when, when uh, so growth hormone, of course, is a natural hormone, it's released from your pituitary, it travels various places in the body and it, and it elaborates uh, the production of uh, IGF-1 and actually a variety of other uh, insulin-like growth factors, which are generally ignored. I think there's at least seven of them, uh, but the, the one that's uh, uh, of current uh, interest is IGF-1. Mm. Uh, which is manufactured by the liver primarily, but other, other places as well. Uh, and um, IGF-1 uh, is sort of a marker of how much uh, growth hormone has been released uh, during the night and throughout the day. So in normal life, your growth hormone goes up in a pulsatile fashion. It kind of spikes up and then comes down. But for some, by some magic way, the IGF-1 in your, in your body in your bloodstream stays pretty constant throughout the, the, the day. So uh, IGF-1 is a great readout of the es essentially uh, of, uh, of growth hormone action and effectiveness. So we use that as a monitor of that. And uh, so then the other agents are used to lower insulin. 
and so we try, you know, we try to titrate the, the individual with either DHEA or metformin, depending upon which works best for a given individual, to lower the uh, the insulin level. Those are the basic interactions involved. Right. So, so you you're monitoring these people as uh, the participants as they go, as they go, and I think Trimex is the same, uh, and you're making these mic these adjustments. Uh, is there something special about the protocol you're doing that requires this? Or would you say that this is probably how all medicine should be delivered? Well, I do think that that's how all medicine should be delivered. But unfortunately, doctors are human beings and they have a limited amount of time. So uh, they generally, and also most drugs are relatively simple. And so you can kind of find the right uh, dose, say a thyroid mm -hmm. hormone, and just stick with that for many years without worrying about it. But uh, the body uh, response to uh, growth hormone and these other agents uh, can change over time and you kind of have to be up on that. You kind of have to watch that happen. And mm. also uh, these are pretty profound and powerful medications and you don't want to just blast somebody with these things all at once. You need to let people adjust and adapt to this slowly and gradually so that everything uh, sort of stays well adjusted. So uh, this is a little bit more intensive than standard medicine, but standard medicine could benefit a little bit more from more, uh, let's say, a tailored uh, or individualized, personalized medicine approaches. I hope that you found the video informative. Please do hit the thumbs up button, subscribe to our channel, and hit the bell button for any new video release notifications. Thank you so much for your kind support. I wish you all well, and we'll speak to you again soon.